Um, all right, great. Well, so welcome everybody. Today we will be covering sprints 96 and 97. And um, I did a quick scan of the team slides and it doesn't look like we have any new team members. Um, welcome. So I think I can directly hand it over to Jakob. I will mention um, that we, I did extend the meeting time to two hours because we had a couple of extra demos um, happening today. Um, but I think we can come in well under that. So um, just as a heads up, if you're wondering about timing. Okay, here we go. These are your slides, Jakob. Over to you. Thank you, Kate. There isn't much in terms of updates. Uh, I think for those who haven't uh, yet reviewed the uh, final uh, honeysuckle release timeline. Uh, there's a link on the next page. Uh, on the next page. Uh, so uh, maybe we should mute in case anybody uh, else. Sorry, what was that, Jakob? Do you think you can mute? Uh, uh, Everybody else on the call. Oh, yeah, that's a that? good. Hold on. I thought maybe that was you. Hold on. Let's see here. Um, Everyone already muted. Mute so all. We'll, oh, we'll cool. Proceed. And then. Small babies. In my house, maybe, all right, there we go. Yeah, I'm not aware of any small babies in my house anymore, but uh, <laughs> I'm mistaken. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, uh, so for those that haven't seen that updated timeline, uh, uh, the link is in the slides. Any questions, uh, guys, uh, please uh, direct towards Alexi Petrenko uh, or ask them on the releases channel. I'll just mention that this week we are already looking at uh, uh, initial releases uh, for the platform core modules uh, for Honeysuckle. Uh, so, so that the timeline is, uh, uh, the, the release process is getting, uh, is, is being started this week. Um, uh, and it's going to take over a month. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's the sort of the, the general update uh, for any details. Please, uh, please take a look at the, the timeline. And I think that's, that's it. I don't have any other updates. Okay, that was quick. All right, then we can go straight to the demos. <clears throat> there. And I should just go out and come back in. There we go. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> okay, it looks like Thunderjet is first on our list here today. Andre, or does Dennis want to say something? Well, I think no, Dennis okay. uh, not on the call. So let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. I can. Oh, great. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, some important um, updates uh, that our team has on Invoice app. Uh, I prepared uh, one invoice for this demo uh, with invoice line. So let's go to, to the form to see. Uh, let's scroll down to extended information. Here we are. So we can see um, uh, fields uh, in one row like uh, currency, current exchange rate to use set exchange rate and uh, set exchange rate. Uh, so based on uh, the latest uh, UX guidelines, uh, if uh, element may become available for use, it should be visible at all times and uh, should be disabled until it's possible to change it. So, and uh, one additionally, we need uh, to show tooltip on it with explanation uh, to user how to enable this field. So, uh, if we hover on uh, set exchange rate, for example, we'll see that it's um, in a read-only mode and uh, with a useful tooltip that says uh, that we need to check uh, use set exchange rate to, to interact with this field. Uh, let's try to do it. But here we can see another tooltip that we need to choose another currency to interact with this field. So um, 
we can understand that we need to change currency and, and other than uh, system currency. Let's do it. Let's select uh, Euro, for example. So we can see that uh, current exchange rate uh, was uh, retrieved and uh, here, is, here is, it is. Now we can uh, change it. It's uh, maybe useful when uh, something go went wrong uh, with a uh, third party uh, library or if there, in, if there is uh, no current exchange rate in the base so user can uh, set it manually let's put uh, three for example for easy understanding what's will happen and let's uh, save our invoice uh, so to approve our invoice we need to distribute money for our invoice line so we can add uh, fund distribution and uh, previously uh, we demonstrate uh, expense classes uh, in settings finance settings where a user can uh, add uh, remove or edit uh, them and uh, in uh, fund in current budget where um, user can assign uh, expense classes on the budget. So let's select fund. Let's select one more fund. Here we can see that uh, if uh, any expense class uh, is assigned on uh, the current budget of the fund, the uh, new field like select uh, is appeared and the uh, user can select uh, expense class if uh, in case uh, there is uh, more than one so let's save it oh we need to set 50 percent so now we can uh, see that we have uh, one quantity and uh, the total is one euro. Let's uh, approve it. Uh, invoice was successfully approved uh, and uh, voucher information was appeared. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, the total is uh, $3 because uh, uh, the system currency is a dollar and uh, exchange rate uh, that was used uh, it's three that we set in uh, invoice uh, form. So if we go to voucher information, uh, here we can see that uh, voucher lines uh, grouped uh, by uh, external account number. Uh, external account number, it's as a result of concatenation of uh, fund uh, external number. It's in finance here, we can see it external number and uh, plus uh, external um, external account number extension in uh, expense classes settings here we can see it so so voucher lines uh, are grouped by it and um, the next thing that i want uh, mentioned is that um, uh, if we uh, go back to edit screen, uh, that uh, all fields uh, after approving uh, were transformed to plain text uh, since user cannot change it. So it's uh, also based on uh, the latest uh, guidelines uh, UX. So uh, now uh, if a user have no chance to change it, uh, so that the no needed to display it like disabled fields. Thank you for your attention. That's all I have for this demo. Thanks, that looks great. Okay. Um, all right, so I have Firebird next with Steph kicking it off. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep, great. So today we'll be showing you um, a quick one story feature that we were able to pick up and complete. So we've added um, a service point filter to requests. And then we will also be showing you our progress with the circulation log. Um, 
Backend work is still underway with this, so we uh, will be showing you um, the UI with some test data. And with that, I'll hand it over to Vlad. Okay. I will share my screen. Um, yes, this one. I hope you can see it. <clears throat> yes. Great. Uh, I will start with filtering by pickup services in requests. And uh, now you can see that we have one additional uh, filter that's pickup service point. And when we choose some options, uh, we can see the list of requests. And in each request, you can see that uh, choose uh, option is available in this request. The same for another one. Yeah. And uh, about circulation log, uh, we implemented a new module, and uh, there you can see a uh, few filters to filter all uh, records. And for example, we can filter by service points, and then you can see the list of them. Uh, also, we can filter by item Barkov, for example, this one, uh, description is yeah, the same. And we have a few filters for uh, different types of objects, for example, loans, um, check out loans, um, the same for notice, only one option. And fee fines, uh, for example, build here. Yeah. And request uh, created. Yeah, you can see this. Also, we add uh, new actions for each type of objects. For example, uh, for fee fines, so we, you can see only three items in this menu. Uh, and for request, for example, you can see two items, and for notice, you can see uh, seven items. Um, and that's it for demo to my side. Wow, Circlog looks awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. We are moving right along then to Scanbit with ST2. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hello. I'm going to show you our development in, in two versions of Folio, where you can see the change made and the difference between versions. Uh, can I uh, show the, my screen, please? Yes, please do. Yes, I have. Uh, here, uh, uh, we one fu function is resize panels of, of set results. Here we, fa we have uh, uh, different, pa different panels. If you do a set, we can see three panels. If you do and we show the, the record information. And, um, there are three panels that were static, and now with our development, you can move the panels, like in inventory and other folio apps. And also with this development, we solve problems to show button and to edit records. I don't know if you can see this screen to, to see the, the difference because no. Here we have uh, an old version, and here we can move the, the panels. So we make this change. Also, we redesign the search panel as the inventory search panel. We have removed the parentheses. That here we have the parentheses. 
and before also it was possible to hide the search options and now it is impossible like in inventory. Here we hide and we have the parentheses and here we don't have. Uh, also, we add a search button that it wasn't available. And before running, before running the search, you have to press enter. And now it can be done pressing enter and also it can be done by pressing the search button. Mm, that we think that it is more intuitive and interrupts the usability of the search. And also we add uh, this option, reset all, that also it is in, in the old version. And we have added this option uh, to, to clean up the words that we have used to do a previous search. And here we can we do research the, the boxes are empty or cleaned, and also if you change from bibliographic to authority, uh, the boxes are empty. Uh, well, this is all from us. Thank you for all your attention. Looks good, ST2. It's nice to see the, um, the cleanup on the searches and filters, getting them more in line with the rest of Folio. Yeah, I agree. It's really nice to see that you showed how it used to look and how it looks now. It's really helpful. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next is FullyJet. Anne Marie. And I lost my unmute at the last minute. Okay, so we have a ton. Lots of things have been coming together. Um, we have a couple quick UI things from Yvonne and Igor, and then we have some more complicated um, matching related stuff from Velodia and deep in the guts of Mark records um, from Ruslan and Kate, but all very much wanted um, functionality from the data import sneeze. So Yvonne? It's due to, you'll have to stop sharing your screen so Yvonne can share his. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. So uh, today, let me show you two small, but I believe uh, pretty useful uh, visual updates uh, that uh, have been implemented since last uh, period for the data import logs uh, view screen. So uh, first of all, let's uh, look in through uh, visual representation of data import screen uh, before changes. Um, so first of all, uh, to enlarge content area and uh, to be more consistent with other parts of our application, uh, the right pane have been completely removed and drag and drop area replace, uh, relocated to the uh, left pane, uh, like in data export, for example. So after our changes, we could uh, observe uh, drag and drop component at the left pane. I uh, want to mention that these components keep all its functionality and change only its location. So the second one feature is related to new status column in our uh, logs drop table. Uh, this status uh, indicate uh, status of finishing uh, finish a job. So if a uh, job finished without any errors and all um, entities have been created, so we can observe complete status. If uh, something uh, goes wrong uh, during job execution, but uh, some entities have been created, but not all of them, uh, we get uh, complete with error status 
and if we have some maybe network error or like in this example choose empty job profile uh, we and a non-entity created during execution of this job so we got failed status also this column can be added to the view all screen uh, with the same uh, variants of the status so i believe that's it from my side for today demo thank you for your attention yep and we were um, glad to steal the design changes from export to make us more in line with them all right and e igor yeah hello everyone let me share my screen so do you see it yes yeah thank you so for today's demo i will show the one uh, piece of functionality for field mapping profiles it will be just ui part uh, so uh, when we create a new mapping profile let's call it like test and uh, when we uh, map mark to mark so our incoming record will be in mark and uh, folio record type will be also mark in this case we will have uh, two different options for this profile uh, to choose it will be modifications and update and for example when we choose modifications uh, the table of this part is a pure um, we see the text uh, about we are modifying the record and in this case we should uh, fill in the required fields in this case for example let's uh, choose action add in this case it's fields subfield and data and save it after saving this mapping profile we will see uh, on the detail screen uh, the same table with the same information so in case when we want to uh, change our mapping profile so we will go to edit mode and uh, now uh, uh, when we try to change uh, the uh, field mapping for mark type uh, uh, from the modification to update in this case we will see the model window with two different options uh to cancel and continue and uh, the user should in, in this case uh, uh, approve that uh, previously saved data data will be wiped out in case if uh, uh, he'll continue so if we choose option cancel we will stay in the same state but when we choose continuous state the previous table is wiped out and we see uh, the new one for update screen uh, with pre-filled fields for indicator one, indicator two, and uh, subfield, and in this case, required field is field and subfield, but subfield is already pre-filled, uh, so we can save it as is, and uh, we will see uh, accordingly table on the view details screen here with all these fields and also one machine. Uh, indicator one field and indicator two is not required and we can leave them as empty field or with space and when we save it we will see the dashes on the uh, detail screen and I suppose that's it from me for this demo thank you if you have any question please ask thanks Igor and you would be surprised how much problem blank indicators versus hard space indicators, required or not required causes. So it's really nice to have that fixed. Um, okay, Velodia is gonna show a little um, uh, nuance to matching that we've made better. Yes, uh, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen. So can you see it? Yes. So uh, today I want to demonstrate your mechanism of replacing names with specific uh, IDs which were retrieved from settings. It will help to use matching logic more comfortable. So uh, we have a demo uh, profile 
job profile which create uh, empty instance and uh, holding with specific uh, permanent location ID. As you can see, it's main library. So uh, I uploaded file and instance with this holding was created. You can see it's instance and here you can see holding with this uh, permanent location ID. So after that, uh, let's uh, create a job profile for updating uh, holdings or which will matched by uh, permanent location ID. So, uh, as you can see, we have uh, this match profile. It will uh, match by this field, subfield uh, 980, subfield D, by permanent location ID. So, and if uh, this one will be matched, it will add uh, holding nodes for our uh, holding which was already created, as you can see here. So I uh, added uh, holding human readable ID and uh, library uh, for this uh, holding. Let's import. and choose this job profile. So, let's check. Yes, and you can see that uh, it was matched and we update our holding which were newly created and uh, new holding nodes uh, was successfully added here. So that's all from my side. Feel free to ask some questions. Thank you. So this one's a little tricky, but basically anything that has reference values that are controlled by UUIDs, you can match based on the text of that value, not, uh, not on the UUID of that value, which is gonna come in handy because most people don't know the UUIDs. All right, so the last two are um, complexities of MARC that we have been working on. Um, two really big things that have been asked for by the, the data import librarians. So Ruslan is going to um, show all those MARC modifications, which is a pretty complex UI actually working and implemented now. Yeah, hello everyone. Now let me share my screen. Now let me know if you yes. uh, can see it. Thank you. So um, to demonstrate mark big modification, I'm going to use uh, this job profile with uh, following actions. Um, uh, here we have uh, modify mark beep action and then create instance and after that uh, modify mark beep to delete 9 uh, 18 fields from the record uh, so uh, at first let's take a look at the mapping profile of the last action here we have only one uh, modification rule uh, to delete uh, 980 field from incoming record and um, Let me describe a uh, mapping profile with multiple modification fields for the first action. Um, here we have uh, these rules and uh, the first one is to add uh, and create a new 264 field with one and uh, blank indicators and uh, which contains ABC subfields uh, in the with uh, uh, these subfields uh, data respectively and the second one is to add uh, and find uh, existing 856 uh, field regardless indicators but with uh, use subfields and uh, 
insert uh, this data with a proxy URI into the use of field or found uh, field before existing data in there. And uh, the next one rule to replace uh, a test string with demo string uh, uh, in a subfield of uh, 500 field with blank indicators. And uh, then we have another one rule to remove draft string from uh, a subfield of uh, 507 field and regardless which indicators. And finally, move data from 901 field uh, with the uh, NSAP field to a new 504 field with blank indicators uh, to the ASAP field. So uh, let's import mark record using describe job profile. Mark identification result. I'm going to find um, newly created instance from the incoming record and uh, to show you modified uh, record <coughs> associated with newly created instance. So according to our modification rule, we've add new to 64 field into the mark field, but uh, actually incoming record doesn't con contain this field. Uh, so we have this field with uh, A indicators and with, uh, oh, with uh, A and uh, BNC subfields, and that is data represented as publication uh, data in the newly created instance. So then we've um, inserted uh, a proxy URI into the 856 uh, field um, before existing data. And uh, uh, this data actually are presented as URI in electronic access here. And after that, we replaced uh, the test string with demo string in the 500 uh, field. So demo node, it's also represented as a general node in the uh, instance. And uh, in our incoming record, uh, we actually have this uh, field with uh, test node data in the subfield. And um, actually we uh, also we removed a draft string uh, from the uh, incoming record file in 507 field. So uh, this uh, string uh, doesn't exist in modified uh, field and uh, in the uh, mapped instance as well. And finally, we moved uh, data from 901 field to newly created uh, 504 field with a indicators. Uh, is this data represented as bibliography node in the mapped instance. And um, uh, beside, uh, so this uh, 901 field uh, contains only one field. This uh, field uh, has been removed from the modified record uh, after data movement. And also regarding um, our last uh, Action profile. We have moved. Uh, we've deleted um, 980 field from the modified record, so this field doesn't exist here. It's gone away. So I believe that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thanks, Ruslan. Incredibly complicated hugely important for libraries that want to be able to add their proxies and be able to brand different fields on the record. So lots of work that's finally come to pass. And then the last piece is the uh, is another thing that's been a high priority ask. Um, Kate is going to show, um, we set up some settings for protecting certain fields from being um, updated in the MARC record. And now we've hooked up the back end for that. 
Yes, hi everyone. Just give me a second. I will show you uh, my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. So, uh, to apply the mark field protection settings, I went to the settings, data import, mark field protections. And here we have the ability to create a new, uh, edit the existing one or delete the uh, mark field protection setting. Um, so to uh, protect some a specific field in the incoming mark, we can specify the field indicator, uh, subfield, and the exact data that can be, that should be matched uh, to protect the incoming field. Or we can leave out the data and specify just the field indicators and subfield, or we can leave out the indicators and specify only subfield or we can protect any field uh, that has the uh, subfield B, for example, and the exact data bibliography. Uh, please also note that uh, we can create, edit, edit or delete only uh, the user um, uh, rules, but we also have some system predefined uh, protection rules for marks uh, which cannot be deleted or updated, and they will always be applied to the incoming marks. So those are 001 and 999 FF fields. Uh, before I go ahead and uh, import some uh, file, uh, let's review the job profile that I created to demonstrate the protections. So it's a simple job profile that will just create the instance and the modify the incoming mark. And if we see the action, we can see the uh, linked mark to mark mapping profile. And it has some, um, some fields specified that they want to, uh, to modify from in the original record. So I would like to delete zero certify field. It was not protected by the settings. Uh, I would like to edit 245-00A subfield. Uh, but as you can remember, uh, we have a rule that would protect this field as well as 338. Uh, we do not have any protections for 500 or 505 fields. And uh, uh, we also have some uh, protections for 700 fields. So let's just go to the data import and uh, import the file. Here I choose my job profile and click run. So in a few seconds, uh, this job should uh, complete and we can see the log. Uh, we could scroll down and review this uh, imported mark but uh, I believe it is better to search for the instance that was created based on the imported mark and just view the source that was uh, saved in the SRS. But here in the instance, we already see from the title that it was not updated. It's to protected 245 field. Uh, and now I would try to show you the original Okay. Sorry for that. Can you see both of the screens now? Yes. 
perfect. So now we can compare the original uh, mark record on the right and the uh, modified record on the left. Uh, we can observe that there is no 035 field. It was removed as it was specified in the mark mapping profile and it, this field was not protected. Uh, but the 245 field stayed intact uh, as well as 338 field subfield B, it was protected. Uh, we can see that 500 fields were modified and some text was uh, inserted before the original stream. The 505 field was deleted uh, as well as um, some of the 600 fields, except the ones that had uh, the subfield B and the text bibliography. We had the rule that uh, would protect any field that contains this subfield. And we also can see that uh, some of the 700 fields uh, were moved to 710 fields. Uh, but the 700 fields that had the subfield E and the text contributors uh, stayed uh, the same because they were protected. And um, I believe that's all that I wanted to share. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kate. So deep in the guts of Mark, um, but like I said, a lot of stuff that we've been working on that finally has come to fruition. So I know we went long, but thanks for your attention. <laughs> thanks for your demos. It does look like you guys have done a ton the past couple of sprints. Um, okay, great. So after Fully Jet, we have Concord and Magda's going to start it off. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, the data import looks really impressive. Um, yeah. You did a wonderful job with the mapping profiles and all the uh, mappings and elimination of the fields. Um, sometimes I'm kind of glad we do the export, not import. Um, uh, however, I want to uh, mention that uh, our popular design look and feel of our landing page, uh, the credit goes to uh, Kimi Kester, Kester uh, that came up with this once we started working on data export at the beginning of the year and um, I'm glad uh, data import found, found it uh, helpful as well. Going back to data export, since our uh, last demo we have uh, completed integration of the front end with the back end to display all uh, supported field names on the transformation form profile. At this point, we support 80 fields of um, 80 fields from instances, holdings, and items uh, records. However, in uh, many instances, the type of the field, like in, uh, in instance indicators, the type of the indicator will uh, affect the mapping. For cases like that, we uh, pull the data on the fly from reference uh, reference data and display it on the transformation uh, form. As a are, result, are, yes. Are, are you sharing, are you planning to share your screen? Or? We, uh, Victor will okay. show the best. This is Thanks. just an uh, intro. Intro. Okay. A lengthy intro. Um, so uh, right now uh, on the transformation form, we have 256 fields and in order to navigate uh, between those, we needed to improve the filtering and searching functionality that will be a demo today shortly. And uh, in addition to work on the mapping profile, we uh, made some changes to uh, the landing page to accommodate a new more granular job execution statuses, the same statuses that uh, data import uses. On the back end uh, work, we completed um, applying custom uh, mapping profiles for all uh, inventory 
in instance uh, inventory records. And this work will be presented during our next demo. We still uh, have a, a little uh, work done for the uh, grouping of the holdings and items in uh, MarkBeep records export. Um, we will start with uh, showing uh, the backend work uh, for cancelling jobs that got stuck in the in progress which uh, may be uh, problematic in uh, some um, large uh, data exports. Uh, Ilya, uh, are you ready to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as Magda mentioned, I'm, I'm going to demo the user story uh, 246. In scope of this user story, we implemented a mechanism to uh, expire and cancel stuck jobs and we created new API endpoint, uh, new field plus data date to understand what job is stuck and uh, also we added a timer to trigger this endpoint uh, periodically and do it automatically. So uh, I'm going to have this demo on our Concord Rancher environment because I had to update uh, a job in database to make it stuck because it's pretty hard to do on other environments. So, and currently I, you can see uh, that one of the job is running and it's running pre pretty, pretty long. Uh, I updated one of the old, our job. So, uh, and um, now it's stuck status in progress. And uh, now I'm going just to call uh, our, a new created uh, endpoint to expire it and clear. So let me do it uh, using a Postman. Uh, yeah, you can see that it's correct URL and a new um, endpoint for expired jobs. So let's do it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you can see that it's uh, at the same time it is uh, stack job is removed and I uh, think if I reload our data expert page, it should be appeared as filed. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, and I think I definitely can show you the uh, database, it was sixth uh, instance of this job. So uh, let me, yeah, uh, let me again uh, query all rows. Yeah, and you can see it's fail and let's check uh, maybe uh, the name of it. And yeah, definitely search instance UED and with the uh, 915 in the end. Uh, so I think that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. A small comment. The, the reason we uh, didn't see uh, this job is most likely uh, because the landing page shows only 25 most recent, recent ah, jobs. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, we are working on uh, the story that will show all of them uh, in the future. So once uh, this work will be integrated with front end, uh, it, everybody will be able to see that. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you. Okay, is there another demo for Concord? Uh, yes, uh, hello guys, it's Victor from Concord and I'm going to present you with uh, my part and uh, first of all, a couple of updates on the landing page. As Marta said, uh, and similar to data import, we have uh, status as updates. Uh, previously, we had uh, one status which which was success for cases when every records every record uh, processed successfully during the export, and also when some of them were successful and some of them not. And so, uh, from now on, we have completed these errors and completed uh, statuses for that and uh, fail uh, which. Uh, uh, which handles the case when we have everything errored out. And another feature uh, which we are working on right now 
is to display log information for the jobs uh, which contains error rate records. And in order to see them, the corresponding uh, row should be clicked. And uh, right now we don't uh, display such information, but hopefully we will be able to show it to you next time. And uh, in order to uh, uh, display the next feature, I'm going to navigate to settings uh, for the particular mapping profile and uh, edit it. As Magda said, we have uh, updates in the uh, mapping profile transformation model and uh, we completed um, integration with uh, the backend and uh, um, display 256 uh, fields right now based on the reference data in the reference environments. Uh, previous demo, we mentioned that uh, those uh, fields are generated on the fly. So in case of this reference data changes, the way, uh, this information will be reflected here. And um, I will, it's also worth mentioning that field names, which we see here are localized. So we do it uh, by uh, mapping uh, display name keys from the backend to the actual uh, translations uh, on the UI. And um, basically the last feature which I want to present you is to basically editing of the given, uh, of, the, of the transformations. So in order to do that, uh, uh, we can, we can uh, add a couple of fields which I want uh, to populate is meeting name. So, and another one is like that. And uh, I forgot to mention that we also added the transformation status, which uh, helps us with uh, with uh, taking the information which we already have selected and. Uh, the one which we have not unselected. As you can see, in this case, we uh, have updated this information about fields found, but preserved the information of total selected fields. So here we can see uh, all selected fields at the moment. And I also want to add one another field, which is resource type. Title. And for this one, I want to assign the next value. And let's check out uh, last time that we have uh, every, every scene in place. So as you can see, the updated fields is going to be the following. And let me uh, save them. As you can see, uh, transformations have been successfully saved. So we can see definitely this new uh, field uh, resource title and meeting name uh, values are updated accordingly. In case if we decide to uh, do additional adjustments, we can uh, hit this edit transformations uh, button again and uh, do the corresponding changes uh, right there. But this time we don't want to do that. And uh, the last action is to save the given uh, mapping profile. And we can see that uh, everything went uh, successfully. So that's uh, all from my side. Thank you. If you have any other questions, uh, please ask. It's going to be great to have all these additional fields. It's wonderful to see. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, thank you, Concord. Uh, Vega is up next with Alex. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Let me know when you see it. We see it. Okay, so today I want to show you some of the work we've done in mod fees finds namely in the field of fee fine actions and uh, by fee fine actions I mean the things you can do with uh, these buttons as the name suggests they allow you to pay waive refund transfer or cancel a fee or a fine 
Now, back in the days, all of the business logic for these actions uh, was handled by front end, and the back end merely served as a storage that would gladly accept and store anything the front end would send its way. And this architecture potentially made it possible for the malevolent user to change the fee fine data arbitrarily, even through the UI or it could potentially cause data corruption due to mishandled concurrent modification of the same data by different users. Um, just to show you what I mean, I can, um, before these changes, I could just duplicate the tab with um, the details of the same fee fine and in both tabs uh, perform, say, full payment of the same fee fine and the backend wouldn't mind it would just accept uh, both requests. Now, obviously this is not very secure and considering the fact that this functionality handles financial transactions, uh, its abuse could potentially lead to real financial damage. So in order to close this loophole, it was decided to move the responsibility for handling these actions from front end to back end. Uh, and much of these changes is not exactly new functionality, it was more of a large scale refactoring. And as a result, we now have a dedicated endpoint for each of these actions, each with its own set of validations and custom business logic. Uh, our UI did not adapt these changes yet, but once it does, it should look exactly the same and the end user should not notice any difference. But uh, under the hood was a sizable amount of work, so we're excited to show it anyway. So the way it works now, I have um, I have a fee uh, that I just created for one hundred dollars, and let's try each one of these actions. I will uh, issue the requests manually, but the results should be visible in the UI. Now, as I said, we have a separate endpoint for each of these actions and each one has its own set of validations. So um, now um, it is not allowed to um, make a payment for a negative number or zero or uh, the amount that exceeds uh, the fee fine initial amount. So it will not allow me to do this. Let's say the requested amount exceeds uh, the remaining amount, but it should allow me to do this. I just made a payment for $10 and if I refresh the page, yeah, we will see that there's uh, a new action, a partial payment for $10. And um, the transfer works uh, the exact same way. It has all the same checks and validations. So if I make a transfer for $5, the UI should reflect it. Yeah, we have tra partial transfer. Uh, same thing with the wave. Yeah, we have a $15 waiver. Um, now the refund is a little bit different. First of all, it's a completely new functionality. We didn't have that before. And um, its business logic is very different from uh, all of the other actions. Like for example, it would not will not allow me uh, to make a refund for an amount that exceeds uh, the total of all the payments and all the transfers. So for example, we have paid $10 and transferred five. So if I try and do the refund for 20. It will not allow me to do that. But it will allow me to do, say, a $12 refund. And as you can see, we have a whole bunch of new actions. Uh, this is because the uh, refund creates a credit and the refund action for uh, both uh, the payment and uh, the transfer. And um, also the payments are handled first. So we have a 
we have made a twelve dollar refund and it fully covered the payment the ten dollar payment as you can see we have ten dollar credit and ten dollar refund and uh, partially covered the trans the five dollar transfer so we have credited and partially refunded um, the five dollar transfer with two dollars and of course we can do cancel as usual the this is the action performed when you press uh, the error button it also closes the fee fine yeah as you can see the fee fine is now closed and this is pretty much it so once this functionality is fully integrated into the ui it will make processing of the fee fine actions uh, more secure and more reliable and this is it thank you if you have any questions i'm happy to answer thanks alex Welcome. important work thanks so it looks like um, from Vega, we've also got a demo from Roman. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show uh, one more small feature from Vega. This is uh, excluding climb return items from item blocking limits. Firstly, I'm going to set up item limit S1. I already created uh, the loan policy. Uh, the loan policy with uh, item limit that equals one. So then I will uh, I will use it in circulation rules for book material type. Save and secondly, I'm going to check out two books. Uh, the first one should be check out it, checked out uh, successfully, but uh, the second one uh, will be rejected because of the item limit. Let's do it. Uh, pattern has reached maximum limit of one items for material type. Uh, now I'm going to uh, mark uh, first loan as uh, climb returned. And then I'll try to check out the second item again. It has been uh, successfully checked out, and uh, but if you want to check out uh, one more book, for example, this one, it will be rejected because of uh, item limit. That's probably it from me, thanks. Nice, item blocks, great to see that. Okay, so after Vega, we have Core Functional. Um, Bogdan and Sergey are gonna show some of the work the team has been doing on um, aging items to loss. So age to lost and the state transitions and fees and fines that go along with that. Um, plus um, our, the remaining work on fast add and some other small features. So over to you, Bogdan. Hello guys, let me share my screen. Um, okay, so uh, on last demo we have shown you uh, our new process that allow uh, detecting and uh, marking aged to lost items. Aged to lost items, uh, these actual items that um, overdue more than some interval that is defined in lost item policy. Um, and uh, today, next iteration of this feature is 
assigning lowest item fees. Um, as this actually another process that is implemented as a separate or could be scheduled job. This executed uh, once per 35 minutes and it mostly controlled by lost item policy. Let's have a quick look into this policy. Um, okay, so here we have uh, two intervals. This first interval means that um, item should be aged lost uh, in uh, 30 minutes after overdue. Actually, it actually means that um, it won't be aged to lost earlier than uh, this interval. Um, this is just because we use this uh, scheduled job. And uh, this scheduling interval cannot match this actual um, interval. And uh, another interval it is uh, defines when uh, this item should be should be charged. It is also possible to set here zero. It means that uh, item will be charged uh, during next run of this um, this uh, charging process. Then we have section um, where we, we can define item item fee and uh, lost item um, processing fee. Here we also have a flag that allow you to enable or disable processing fee for, for age to lost items. All right, let's go back to the <clears throat> loan. Okay, so as you can see this loan already age to lost. Uh, also we have updated this lost field previously. Uh, uh, it uh, was displaying uh, date and time when uh, item was declared lost, but now it also displays uh, date and time when item was aged to lost. Yeah, and also we have we have already, so as you can see, item was aged to lost at 9:28, and uh, um, we have um, lost item fees assigned. Let's just open them. There is a processing fee and a item fee. If we open this fee, we can um, check creation date. So it is 9.43. It is actually um, 15 minutes after agent lost, what is correct as per policy. Assuming that there might be some delay between running these two jobs. Um, okay, so next feature is about closing age to lost items when there is nothing to charge. Just as you can see here, item was age to lost at 9.58. And then uh, this charging process uh, was executed and it is decided that uh, nothing has to be charged and um, we can easily close this loan as, and uh, mark the item as lost and paid. Um, okay. Next block of features uh, related to declared lost items. Um, when um, it is possible now to uh, renew a declared lost item, um, when uh, there is some uh, lost fees and fines assigned to to the item during review, we should uh, we are now able to um, cancel remaining amount and refund what is already has been paid or waived or sorry paid or, or transferred. Um, let's just try it. Okay, so it is just a usual renewal. It is failed because we need some extra permission um, to override declared lost item. Let's click override. Okay, so item now has check it out status and um, yeah, and uh, lost item fees now canceled both. 
Okay, yeah. And uh, another small small improvement related to um, default uh, PubSub user, uh, we have updated uh, uh, we have updated this user with uh, last name property. It is now system, and it allow us properly display source when item is uh, automatically closed when a related recent finds. Uh, the result. Um, okay, and uh, the last uh, feature that actually um, Jeremy has implemented is related to uh, user nodes when we resolve claim as uh, declared lost or missing. So here I have a claim return item. When I now try to Resolve claim is missing. Okay, it is marked as missing, and let's take a look at the user. Yeah, here we have created a user node that saying that item was claim return, but um, then it was marked as missing. This information is needed for staff users. Um, that's actually it, what I have to show. Any questions, maybe? Okay, thank you, guys. Thanks, Bogdan. Looks great. Sergey, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, let me know, Kate, please, if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Oh, great. I'd like to start with a couple of small improvements uh, to the inventory application. And first of them is when we view holdings record in detail view, the action menu now has the same item order edit duplicate delete uh, that uh, that's uh, already set in instance action menu edit duplicate or in item action menu edit duplicate delete um, next improvement is also in inventory application and as you can notice, the holding accordion with empty list of items is collapsed by default. And uh, in open mode, you cannot see any rows with dashes uh, like you did before. At the same time, we have the drag and drop uh, mode here. And when we turn on, you can see that the row with dashes appeared here in order to have the ability to move uh, items from one holding holdings to another uh, when we after turning off the drag and drop mode uh, we return to the initial state next uh, now let's go to the filter pane and in the item segment let me reset it all. In the item segment, uh, you can see the new uh, filter option, H to lost. And it works the same as the rest of the filters on this page. After clicking uh, in the result pane, we get the uh, instant records in which uh, the uh, item has age to lost status and uh, let's uh, try to create a request for the item with the age to lost status let's go to the request application and create new paste the bar barcode when uh, i click uh, the enter button it should bring up a model 
yeah, you can see this model that uh, says the this uh, item cannot be requested. Uh, in order, because it has uh, because the item status is age to lost. Uh, this functionality should be familiar to you by the items with the status uh, declared lost, for example. Uh, now let's try to check in such an item. Let's go to the check in application, paste the barcode in the field, enter. And uh, you can see the confirmation model appears after clicking confirm button. Uh, let's go to the loan details. Let's check this. Uh, this uh, item, this loan became closed and uh, the item status changed from age to loss to in transit and please note that the uh, value of the lost field has been replaced with a dash next two stories i'd like to demo are a continuation of the development uh, of the uh, development of the fasted instance record functionality let's go to the inventory application oh. Sorry, I need to reload my page. Ah, here you are. Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, let's take a look on the new fast at record form. And at that moment, we have the ability to specify uh, default suppress from discovery and instance status from. Uh, uh, depending on the values uh, in the fasted settings page. Let me show how it works. Let's go to the settings inventory. Fast, uh, you can see that uh, the new option, uh, new setting fasted appeared here. And we have two selectors, one for default instant status another for suppress from discovery uh, let's select uh, temporary for example and no for suppress from discovery save uh, let's go back to the inventory reopen the form and as you can see the default settings have been submitted to this form and finally the story that's definitely worth to be shown in today's demo although it's actually a bug um, but i could call it uh, improvement as we now got the ability to assign a lot of permissions to users more efficiently and uh, to better understand the problem i'm going i'm gonna go to the bug fest golden road environment and uh, i'm gonna assign a lot of permission to the user i already create uh, the user here it is and uh, there are no permission for for him let's set it and add and add in uh, let's add all of these 253 permissions save and save and uh, as you can see it and takes we wait. Uh, uh, yeah it takes forever it take... sorry it takes forever yeah <laughs> it takes a lot of time to complete the operation uh, in other words the more permissions the longer the process but uh, this is uh, not the most inconvenient thing yet if uh, during the assignment process we 
uh, go to another user and try to edit their profile, we get a strange blinking UI here. And uh, this will continue until the previous user has been assigned all permissions. Uh, let's stop it and let's go back to the snapshot and do the same here. Uh, user. I'll switch to users. Yeah, you're still in inventory. Oh, so. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we can have the user here and let's do the same here. Edit user permissions, add permissions. We're gonna add all of these more than 200 permissions. Save, save, and here we go. Whoa. Woo <laughs> everything, awesome. everything. Yeah, yeah, everything happens instantly <laughs> and doesn't affect any other users we can check it set uh, edit it works correctly and that's, that's basically yeah. because uh, before that we had uh, the process of the one by one permission permissions assignment with multiple requests uh, in other words, one request for each permission. And now this process has been replaced with all in one assignment in a single request. And the idea of how to fix this bug was suggested by Julian and the implementation work was done by Matt Connolly. Thank you, Matt, great job. Uh, so that's all I wanted to show you today. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask them now or maybe later. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. And on that high note, we are going to turn it over to Thor, um, which has, um, the Thor team has two demos today. Um, and the first part is a G, some GB, GBV work. And Martina Schild is going to do an intro there. Thanks, Kate, and hi all. Yes, I'm happy to give the intro to the current status demo on the CBS to Folio API. And about the background for this project of index data and GBV. And if you could click to the second slide, Nils Eric, that would be great. Thanks. Um, all GBV libraries are cataloging their resources in a central database from OCLC called CBS. And cataloging is done using a client software, also from OCLC. Folio is to replace the local ILS, and that would then include inventory. So the starting point was the bibliographical data that a library holds needs to be initially loaded from CBS to inventory. And then as a routine, every time holdings and items are added to a newly created or existing bib record in CBS, the data needs to be delivered to inventory as well. And every time records are edited in CBS, the inventory instance, holdings, and or items need to be updated too. Data management includes create and edit, as just mentioned, and delete and move holdings and items when triggered by the external source. So all your work is going on in CBS and inventory is basically a copy of it. Is that right? Yes, Martin? our cataloging work is done in CBS and then the copy is in inventory and there we would link to the um, acquisitions data. And that's mm -hmm. how it works at the moment with the OCLC LBS that we have or ILS at, that we have. And this will be the same then with Folio that's intended. Okay. 
and the overall concept that is quite complicated maybe will be officially and in detail presented in a separate demo as soon as it, as it is finally completed. So yeah, that will be soon. And with that said, I will hand over to Charles who will do the demo. Yes, um, right. So we have uh, four components that are, are kind of doing this, this work. Um, so we have the, of course, the, the cataloging system, the CVS cataloging system. And uh, then it goes through the OOF, the OUF, uh, which we, actually, this is what we, one, one of our components. Um, there's, there's two OCLC binary scripts in there and then uh, several uh, scripts and APIs that index data added to that to manage uh, updates and <clears throat> the OUF it creates XML records from Pika Plus and then it will send it to our, our harvester software which does the conversion from XML to uh, inventory uh, XML for folio uh, and, and actually into a JSON format. And then, and that will use the mod inventory update module to insert new or update records into the fo targeted folio system. So that would be um, basically what happens there. And, um, and there's a, another slide that will show more in detail what each, which happens on each, uh, each leg of the trip. So, uh, yeah, so we just have a cataloging system there. Um, and it sends out an update signal when, when something is updated or added. Uh, the API, the OOF API, then, um, has this binary script that's sent by OCLC to create an update signal file. And then we have a Perl script, which reads the file and creates fetch files so that the OOF fetch script can, it knows what titles to fetch from the central library system. Um, and then the decode profile will then, um, it, it creates the XML. Um, it notifies the harvester that there's some new files that you can harvest. <clears throat> and then the harvester will go right ahead and um, do the transformation and, and push it into uh, my inventory update. So um, I guess that's what I want to demo that complete um, process right now. So I will um, share, first of all, the cataloging uh, software, the CVS cataloging interface. Uh, this is um, runs on a Windows platform. So I'm using this on a, a virtual machine that has a Windows server on it. And it, it works, works fine for these purposes for testing. So I will uh, quickly add a new record. And this is in a format called uh, Pika 3. And um, so I'll have to insert new record. I will, I will paste the text into that. Um, I'll hit enter. Now that this creates a new record with the control number, this control number right here. Now it will go through some of our software and uh, let me share 
I'll switch to my um, And we'll share, uh, I'll show um, what's happening with some of the logs. Um, we can look at the trace log. Does everybody see this screen, by the way? I'm, I'm not sure if. Yeah, yeah we can. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So here's a trace log uh, created by the OUF update script. It received the one record, created the title file, and um, we can see what uh, the Pika pull file did, uh, uh, script did, and it created the fetch file. Um, and then decode um, created this XML file. And now it's telling the harvester to run the job. And now we can look at the harvester log. Um, and uh, it looks like we got one instance was processed. Um, and, and that's, that's good, because that's all we, we sent. <clears throat> and oh, by the way, just in case you're interested, this is what uh, the Pika XML file looks like after it was created and converted. And so then there's a, a map after this that would take the Pika data and turn it into the inventory field? Yes. Okay. And I can show you that right now. This is in the Harvester software. Uh, we have something called transformation steps. Uh, there's a Pika to instance, a general Pika to instance transfer uh, XSL file. Uh, very, very long, very complex. Um, and this is what's, do, you know, assigning the UUIDs for, uh, you know, uh, for resource, resource types and, and, and everything. Um, and then uh, there's another a, a codes to UID, which will be more of like your local stuff, like locations, um, item notes, what, whatever might be more local. Uh, and, and so those two style sheets do this transformation. And, um, and, and then it will send it into our demo uh, folio instance. Um, I will search for uh, sprint review because I think that's what I called it. And this is the record that was just created. Um, no items or anything else. Now, uh, this, so your source K10 plus, that's a new source. That's what you're using to lock down the editing? Yes. Okay. Right. And also, we don't want the instance records to be edited either. So we're going to do that through permissions. So uh, instance will not be editable by any, by most okay. people. Gotcha. All right, so uh, I'll go back to the chat logging uh, screen again. And I'll add an item. So let's see, insert E1, this means insert copy one, paste some data in there, and now it added the item record, and soon it will go through this pipeline, and probably like in under five seconds should, we should have an item record if I refresh this. Ah, there it is. So we got the item record with the test holdings call number. And uh, so you can't see inventory they don't see right it. now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, right. Okay. So here we have the newly created item record on, on the same sprint. Sprint review test record one. 
Um, so that, that worked uh, nicely. Um, what I'll do now is, is quickly just add another, another record. So um, any edits to the holdings or the item records is gonna happen up in CBS, is that correct? That is correct. In okay. fact, um, that's interesting. Yes, that, it is. And it's all done in one, one spot. And um, so, right, it, it, all, it all comes through. Um, you could I say will, CBS is the, the source of truth for this system. It is. It's, it's very The truthful. source record storage, as it were. Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to quick insert another record. You don't need to see this, but um, I just want to put in another big record quickly. And um, so we should see if I refresh, uh, if I redo this search. We'll have one called uh, Sprint Record, Sprint Review Test Record 2. And that does not have an item. Now we do have this uh, ability to, um, I'll go back to sharing the catalog screen again. Um, to uh, move items between records, which um, I guess happens quite often, and it's, it's pretty valuable. I think uh, this is one of the po more powerful things about mod inventory update. It, 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 it can detect when an item gets moved, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So um, I'll copy this control number. I will take a bring up the first record that I created with the item, and now I'm going to transfer uh, all items to the other PPM. So you see the item disappeared from there. Um, it on the cataloging system, it got moved to this uh, record two. If we re um, refresh the screen, uh, okay, test record one no longer has the item record. Test record two does. Um, so, and also what's in very important here, if you look at the, at the metadata, oh, I better share my screen. All right, I'll go back. Uh, test record one had the item record, but no longer test record two does have it in here. Um, and we will notice that the, uh, the original create date is, uh, it was four minutes ago, but it got updated when it was transferred, uh, you know, just because it got a new instance ID or holdings record ID. So this is, um, this keeps all connections to order records, loans, uh, whatever else needs to be taken, you know, kept track of when, when an item moves. So, um, I, oh, and then one more, one more thing. Uh, it also will delete records. I'll go back to the cataloging system again. Um, if I want to say delete this record along with the holding, I can just, Hit the delete button here. It will delete it from the cataloging system. And now I'll go to back to folio. 
and I'll redo this search. And test record two is no longer there. Only test record one. So it does it does everything. Whoa, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, this looks great. Thank you, Charles. You're welcome. Looks like there's some questions in chat as well. So that's uh, a conversation. <laughs> really nice interesting. Conversation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, my pleasure. All right. And with that, oh, and actually, is Niels Eric also going to demo something on this? Yes, Niels Eric is next now. There. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. So I'm going to uh, show you. Uh, uh, a bit about the uh, internals of uh, a mod inventory update, uh, which is the module that was sitting at the, the end of that process that uh, Charles just des uh, described just before, uh, just before you get to um, uh, inventory storage. So uh, what we have in, in the middle here is uh, 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 the mod inventory update. Uh, the input to a uh, mod inventory update is what I call uh, an inventory, uh, oh, let's get into bay, inventory uh, record set. Uh, so it's, um, it's a structure uh, that uh, the harvester, in this case, construct uh, containing an instance. Uh, and in, in the case of uh, GBV and CBS, uh, everything is, uh, 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 has a, human readable IDs uh, attach uh, when they come to inventory update. So there's an instance with the HRID, there are holdings, one or more holdings with HRIDs and uh, one or more uh, items for each holding uh, uh, with HRIDs uh, embedded into each other. Uh, I have a, a, a JSON file that shows uh, what it looks like. So, so this, is, uh, this is basically what, um, uh, what Charles was, uh, sending uh, by means of uh, the, 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 the harvest uh, transformation pipeline uh, to mod inventory update. So you have the instance up here, uh, a very short instance. So there's actually a problem with that, uh, but uh, that's because uh, Charles just showed you the happy path. So I'm gonna show you instead some of the error scenarios that uh, the module handles. And it has no. holding records, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Some... I just yep. realized we have still the Z3950 demo and also um, Anton needs to do an update that he absolutely yeah. needs to do. So not to cut you off right in the middle, okay. but if you could just find I'll, I'll uh, hurry up. Awesome. Um, oh. So, um, so the uh, inventory update uh, is uh, structured uh, internally with the uh, a model of what needs to be updated and that is based on the incoming uh, record and then it will uh, of course ask whether the uh, record exists already in inventory storage uh, and if it does exist it will pull in that existing inventory record set which is the same structure that it has here. Uh, it will then take uh, the, the incoming uh, record set uh, which I call the model. It will uh, populate it with the UUIDs, either create new ones if they, the, these records don't exist already, or pick uh, the existing UUIDs based uh, on the uh, human readable IDs from the existing inventory record set. Based on that, it will create an update plan. So it will plan uh, exactly how to update inventory storage uh, uh, to uh, to uh, replicate this model uh, in uh, inventory storage. Um, and once it's uh, done, it will execute the uh, update plan uh, with a bunch of uh, low level uh, storage create update uh, delete methods. And uh, finally, it will uh, return a report uh, with the update matrix and with the errors. The thing is, this is an aggregate update where you can potentially upgrade uh, many, many uh, records, uh, just one instance, but many holdings, many items, and you need to know what uh, went wrong in, in uh, each case. Um, so if I quickly, um, I can uh, try and uh, send this, um, 
Uh, this uh, no child uh, record, that's the problem with the, this uh, record I just showed you, that it has no title. So, uh, so this is an example of a record that uh, has some error. So uh, there's, uh, there's no child here. So, that, so in the response, you get the model that, uh, that Inventor Update tried to uh, submit, and then you get some statistics uh, about what failed and what completed. And there was one failed failure to create an instance, and then there was uh, two holdings records skipped because you couldn't create the instance, then you can't create the holdings. There were four item records skipped. Uh, and then uh, finally, there are the uh, errors uh, in, in a, an array down here. Uh, it has, uh, in, in, a, yeah, in an array, there can be multiple errors. And there it has the, uh, uh, the, the exact error message uh, from, from the, uh, from the inventory storage and and you can have the uh, uh, many different uh, kinds of uh, of uh, uh, error messages some are in json format some are more or less directly uh, or, or, or or more or less verbatim uh, postgres errors but but uh, this is an example of uh, uh, of uh, uh, this is an example of a record with uh, multiple uh, referential issues, so that would be uh, that would be uh, 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 SQL errors, and uh, you can see that, that there are problems with the holdings, location ID not existing, and with the uh, and for for some uh, for some of the items, the uh, per permanent loan time uh, ID is uh, not existing, uh, stuff like that, and uh, the. Uh, the client can then use the metrics and the errors to uh, report back to, in this case, uh, uh, in the harvester log, uh, uh, how how much succeeded, how much failed, and uh, what were the errors, if uh, if any. Uh, you can also delete, as uh, Charles said, but uh, I'm not going to go uh, more into that because uh, of the time constraint. But but it basically uses the same uh, uh, components to do a delete, except of course there's no incoming record, so it doesn't create a model of of what to update. But it based on the existing uh, record set, it finds out what to delete, and then it goes ahead and and delete that. Um, using these components, you can. Uh, it, they're designed uh, so that you can easily uh, create uh, new uh, APIs. So the one that uh, uh, that uh, Charles showed was the update inventory by HRID, where we assume that all records have uh, human readable IDs. And we have another API that we maybe can uh, uh, show you some other time uh, that is uh, related to reshare, where you update a shared inventory and where the identifier that you query by up here is actually a match key that is constructed by inventory update. So you have some opportunities to uh, to use the model and the record set and the update plan to uh, basically create new uh, uh, update uh, logics. But but so far we have the these uh, two interfaces that do uh, 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 insert updates and and uh, deletes. And this is where you can find more information about the uh, uh, about the APIs. There are more details there. Yeah. Thank you, Nils. I'm sorry to rush you. Are you done? Yes, I'm done. I just need to All find right. the unshare share button. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, I guess we're gonna to have to go a little bit over today. I know some people are gonna to have to drop off at the hour, but these meetings are recorded, so you'll be able to come back and, and listen to the recording. Um, so I think we can go ahead then, Mike, with your Z3950. Lovely, thank you. Uh, are you hearing me? We yes. are. Good, and are you seeing a very exciting page from GitHub? <laughs> yes, very exciting. Okay, brilliant. So the reason I'm showing you this is because it's uh, the Z3950 server is it's a new piece of software. Basically, it's it's along the lines of being an edge module. The point is that it lives in some sense outside of Folio and is a client to the inventory module. Um, so just as the GBV project is really all about getting stuff into inventory, this is one of the ways of getting it out again. 
So you're welcome to come in here, browse the documentation of which there is plenty. Um, most important being this document here on the capabilities of the Z3950 server. So we'll go into some detail about uh, how it supports authentication, searching, retrieval and sorting. Uh, and also how you can use it with the SRU protocol, which I'll show you in a moment. So uh, those of you who are familiar with Z3950, please do take a look over this and play with it. And we're keen to get bug reports. We are expecting them at this early stage. Um, let me just show you what it looks like. It never makes the most exciting demonstration. Uh, down here in the lower window, I'm running the server. You can see it's listening on a specified port and using the trusty old Yes, command line client client. I'm going to connect to that port, and you can see this initialization request has been accepted. Uh, and if I do a search for, oh, can't type the word find. That isn't going to help. Can't believe I'm burning precious seconds by mistyping the word find, and then even more precious seconds by complaining about that fact. What an idiot! Anyway, uh, so searching as you would expect. Um, and if we show you the result, uh, the first of the records that are in here, you see by default this comes back uh, as a mark record, which I know will give the more library focused folks there a nice warm feeling. Uh, but there's a bunch of different information we can see. So crucially, um, what's happening is instead of going straight to inventory, we're going through mod GraphQL, which knows how to fan searches out. So we're finding instances, but also the holdings records associated with those instances and also the items associated with those. So we can see all of that information in the raw JSON format that it comes back. And if I show you that now in JSON, uh, as we scroll back through here, you'll recognize, if you're familiar with the inventory data model, you'll recognize the fields and the structures and all these created by user IDs that we don't necessarily need. But there they all are. And in among all this, you'll also see here we've got some holdings information and some items information. Um, so that's the JSON truth, but if you want to work with that in XML, um, it can also serve it in that form. So this is a literal translation of the, the JSON that came back. Or within the XML record syntax, you can also see it in other formats, like uh, the US mark representation in XML, uh, which again will be familiar to people who know mark XML. Uh, and the interesting one, I think the most interesting of these, is the uh, OPEC format, which is what you'll want for obviously supporting uh, OPECs, but more realistically uh, interlibrary lending. So this is, I'm showing you the same record each time, but in different formats. And you, if I scroll up a bit here, I've, I've made the font big, you'll recognize here's the same mark record we saw before, but associated with that, we have the information about the holdings as well, including... Uh, where that information exists, uh, real-time availability information. So, for the, uh, for the mark portion, portion, Mike, is it yeah. creating a mark on the fly, or is it going and grabbing the source mark record? Thank you. Crucial question. Yeah, at the moment, this is only working with SRS, so it's fetching okay. the record from there um, and decorating that with the holdings and items information from Folio Inventory. So down the line, we certainly will want to make it so that you can also generate mark records on the fly from inventory. And in fact, skeletal code is there to do that. Um, but nobody seems to actually have that requirement at this stage, so we've not put a lot of time into it. Um, we support all the Boolean operations, searching against a whole bunch of different uh, fields. So for example, uh, we can find... Um, those of you who know your Z3950 bib1 attribute set will recognize 1 equals 4 as meaning a title search. So books that are over about water or um, or that were written by the author. Sorry, I should have figured out what I was going to type before I started. Uh, by the author Hill. Uh, and down here you can see in this window, it tells you how it's translating this. And you can see if you recognize your folio CQL, especially if you use the so-called query search in the inventory module, you'll see this title equals water or contributors uh, with the relation modifier name is hill. So you, you'll recognize um, that that's the CQL that's getting translated to. And we also support uh, Z3950 sorting, which I won't bore you with at the moment. 
So generally, all the, the details of that are in the document. So uh, do play with the Z3950 client of your choice. The last thing I want to show you is that um, the same server also supports SRU, which is the an XML over HTTP protocol for searching data stores of various kinds. And it'll provide you the exact same information, but this time uh, using a URL. So you can see up here in the URL bar, all the information is just in query parameters. So uh, in particular, here's the query, looking for title equals A, how many records we want to get back, and that we want to see it in the OPAC schema. So here it is, it's come back in the OPAC schema. As before, there's a, an XML uh, rendition this time of the mark record. And down at the bottom, this is the, uh, the OPAC availability, uh, shelving locations availability and whatnot. Um, and as before, uh, we can get this information in various different formats. So uh, here's the raw format uh, that exactly corresponds to what's in the inventory model. And that's most useful if you want to uh, debug what's, what, what you're seeing in the other record formats. And you want to see what's the real truth that this came from. So if you find it easier to write, so if you want to integrate with um, inventory, maybe write your own uh, OPAC UI or something like that, then using the SRU approach is possibly a, a simpler way with modern toolkits than Z3950. But either way, both those protocols are supported, along with, if anyone remembers it, SRW, that's the SOAP-based protocol for doing similar kinds of searching and retrieval. So if anybody wants to use that, that's in there as well. So I think those are the main points. I'll be happy to take any questions. Stunned silence. Craig asked, is this multi-tenant in the chat? Ah. Um, that's, that's the very next thing on the to-dos, actually. So at the moment, the configuration, I'm going to show you what the configuration looks like. Uh, you can see that it has uh, various things wired into it. So the Okapi information, uh, so it looks at these environment variables, Okapi URL, uh, Okapi tenant, to figure out uh, where to uh, connect to. Uh, and the bits that come after the hyphens in there, that's a bash-like substitution syntax. That's it's just convenient for running this. If you don't set the variables, those are default values. And there's a bunch of other stuff in this configuration as well. Here you'll recognize this index map is saying how the various bib1 use attributes are mapped to CQL um, indexes. Um, so what we want to do is make it so that uh, the Z3950 database name that you're searching in uh, is used to specify which tenant. You'll have noticed if you're a sophisticated YAS command line client user that when I connected earlier I didn't even bother specifying a, a database name at all and just said what port to connect to. And that's because the database name is currently ignored. So the plan is that will determine the tenant um, so that you will use a single server running on a, uh, um, on a host to serve Z3950 for the multiple instances that are on that host. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I'm sure if people have questions, they can also contact you via Slack. Please do, yeah, absolutely. I'm always watching Slack. All right, thank you. Thank you for speeding through. I really appreciate it. So no now problem. we can turn over to Anton, who has some important announcements about testing. OK. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see my screen. So let's um, plow through this, because it's important stuff, but everybody numb and tight after two hours of presentations. So it's a perfect time to tell you something important. Uh, UI testing team was working for a couple months to come up with the guidelines. You can see people who more or less were involved in what I'm about to tell you. Uh, so general guidelines going forward, uh, some of them are staying, some of them are new. So. We're keeping 80% code coverage requirement for, for tests. So if you have a module, 
uh, you need to, uh, the acceptance criteria should be that you have at least 80% test code coverage. Critical path should be included into this 80%, so it's a little change because you can totally avoid critical paths by still cre um, building 80% coverage. So please include critical path test cases into, uh, into your initial 80%. And with the um, remaining 20%, what we're going to do, we're going to ask you to create a test for every UI bug. So if you have a bug, then your acceptance criteria uh, for, that, uh, for that bug should be that, um, uh, should include creation of an automated test if it's applicable. So please review your acceptance criteria. Uh, all the teams should review it and make sure that you have a requirement of creating automated test for every bug. Now switching to uh, uh, UI testing tools. So UI testing team reviewed a lot of tools and at the end uh, that effect, uh, we made, uh, team made decision to use RTL just for unit and integration tests. So basically what it means that uh, old big test will be replaced with RTL just. So all new functionality should be uh, covered by RTL just, so please don't invest more time in old big test. So, Existing big test uh, uh, test cases uh, sh uh, have to be re-implemented with RTL Jest. However, it's not instant. Uh, the deadline for that work is uh, for the next 12 months. So we expect that uh, big tests will be completely phased out. Old big tests will be completely phased out by Q3 of 2021. During that process, uh, we would like team to maintain um, two, um, uh, two coverage reports. So uh, one for big test and one for uh, RTL just, so you know when you can throw big tests uh, out. So when you replay, when you create 80 plus percent uh, coverage with RTL just, then you can, uh, you can drop the test. Until then, you should run big test and use it to make sure that you don't have any, um, you know, um, anything broken in your UI modules. So uh, there will be DevOps work involved to enable uh, two coverage reports in your uh, in, uh, respective UI module builds. And it mostly will be uh, DevOps tasks, not developer, uh, not developer, developer task. Uh, the exception to the uh, rule will be Stripes and uh, Stripes, uh, Stripes uh, modules and end-to-end -end tests. They will be using the next version of uh, Big Test, which is coming out in um, in October. So. It only, so this uh, announcement only concerns developers that are working with Stripes or will be working on end-to-end uh, end -end tests. So it's a very small number of people that will, will be involved with that. So uh, Stripes transition, uh, same, um, same thing. Uh, uh, team will have till uh, Q3 of 2021 to replace existing big tests with the new big test. And end-to-end -end test suite transition, so I'm referring to nightmare JS tests. Uh, so we'll, uh, uh, the goal is to replace one-to-one -one, uh, what we have in nightmare now with big tests and then start growing uh, coverage, uh, not coverage, but st start adding test cases uh, to the new test suite to help with execution of bug fest and taking uh, test cases from bug fest test plan and in automating them with the new big, uh, big test test suite. And also our goal is to um, run this test as a separate pipeline um, 
in uh, uh, daily as an integration uh, UI integration test. And also we're planning to design this test so it can be ran against any environment. So it can be used in scratch dev environments and in uh, reference environments and bug fest or customer staging environments as well. So that's all I had to say. Um, there are any questions? So we're not, we don't have quarters in 2021, at least for the development cycles. So is it really end of Q3 2021 or end of the third release in 2021? Uh, I think it's at end of uh, end of September of uh, twelve months. Okay. And I think it's a uh, generous and plenty of time to plan the work and uh, estimate the work and execute. I just have one question. Um, as I understand, uh, we can freely um, start with this. I mean, introducing just uh, after this uh, DevOps activity is done, right? You can start developing tests now in random locally. And I don't think it will take us a long time to uh, add another step to UI, um, uh, UI uh, build to, to run uh, RTL Jest and collect separate um, Istanbul report on it. So it shouldn't take us long. So you could start um, working on, on the test right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, and I assume if people have questions, they can reach out to you on Slack. Uh, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And there's a link in the presentation to UI testing team. So there are meeting notes and um, uh, there are recordings of the meetings if somebody uh, somebody is interested, but okay. that's pretty much what uh, our UI testing team decided to do going forward. So. All right. All right. Well, thank you for the update, Anton, uh, and thank everybody for all the excellent demos um, today. I appreciate uh, your staying late. Um, we'll share the recording, so if anyone had to drop off, they can catch, catch up there. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day.